servers. It's always a, a privilege to celebrate together. After church, we have another Lord's Supper. <laughs> we have a feast downstairs. Um, we had a, a meeting here yesterday when I think we had too much food. <laughs> well, I know we had too much food, uh, but we have tacos and taco bar and stuff like that downstairs. If, if you'd like to stay for lunch, everybody's welcome. Everybody's welcome to stay. And uh, we have more than enough food for today and probably enough food to take home after that. <laughs> so I think we're good. I think we're good. Um, but this morning we have uh, what used to be called table fellowship. And the reason why it was called table fellowship is like the Lord's Last Supper. They would sit around the table and they would break the bread and they would fellowship together. And, uh, and then they would pass the goblet around and they would partake of that as well. Uh, we do it slightly differently today. Still the same idea. We're remembering the Lord, what he did. And so all believers are welcome to partake. And uh, just make sure that you're right here with him. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the symbols that are up here, the the fruit of the vine and, and the bread, Lord. And Father, I just pray that as we partake of this, that we'll think and remember what the Bible says happened to you on that day. And that was your sacrifice that we are made clean. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name.
long chapter. I'm not going to be preaching every verse, promise. It may seem like it, <laughs> but no. But the thing that's important for us to think about today is what this chapter is going to teach us, how everyone, absolutely everyone, is accepted in Christ in Paul's mind. I think about um, some of the political situations that we're in today and, and some of the persecution that's going on in our country. Um, to, I'm not talking about with Christians in general, but I'm talking about people in general. Um, there's some anti-Chinese uh, going on. You know, if you're Oriental, some people are getting slammed for that. Of course, we've always had the African-American stuff going. Now it's anti-white stuff. You know, we have all that going on. Then we have the, uh, the immigrants that are coming into the country and this big pushback on that. And uh, how many of you hear uh, your ancestors were uh, just born here. You're, you're, you originated in America. In America. You don't know, maybe. Not many. Okay, the percentage is low. Very low. You might have some uh, American Indian in you. But then there's pushback on that too. And we have it going crazy. We took a trip to Hawaii. We were privileged to take a trip to Hawaii. And the Hawaiians are very angry at Americans <laughs> because we stole their land. Yes, we did. We're guilty. As a nation, we are guilty. Uh, I think that can be said of almost every uh, American Indian tribe in the United States. Yet, how many of us accept people for face value as a person? Did you know that up into the Civil War, if you were African American, you're only, I believe, I might be getting this wrong, one third human. Seriously. I, I'm not exactly sure of the percentage. I think that's what it is. But you weren't fully human. You're only part human. And that's how they justified slavery in America. Because you were and that's the same way they treated the the uh, American Indians, too. If you weren't white, that's how they treated you. So wrong. So wrong. And even up to this day, today, we have prejudice going on in our nation, our educated Christian nation. God had to deal with this with his apostles as well. And in Acts chapter 10, we have the account of Cornelius and Peter and the Gentiles and how God got Peter to go to them and preach the gospel. That, that's the skinny of it. That's the skinny of it. I, we can go home now, right? No. <laughs> oh, we have to eat first. I'm sorry. That's right. We're Baptists. Yeah, okay. All right. That's right. All right. So the, the deal is, Let's look at this. We, we got four points here, and we'll take them in succession. First one is, is, is Cornelius' vision. Now, Cornelius was a godly man. It says so in verse 2. But he was also a centurion for the Italian cohort, the guard. He is over basically 600 men. Okay, He was an important person. In verse 2, it says he was a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. Sounds like a good guy. He did not say, he did not know Jesus yet. Sounds like a great person. Wouldn't you like all Baptists to be like this? All Christians to be like this? You know, one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms, and alms is an offering, uh, support to the Jewish people, and he prayed to God continually. Wouldn't you wish that you were like this? Let's just get personal. Let's just throw it in our face. How do you measure that? You know, I think, well, he's, he's way up there. 
He'd be one of our star players. Pretty good. And as he is praying, continue, guess what? God came to him. Now, I know it says in verse 3, it says, he clearly saw a vision of an angel of God. And verse 4, he says, who are, you know, what is it, Lord? Kind of sounds like the Apostle Paul when he says, who are you, Lord? Was this Jesus, I, the angel of God who addressed Cornelius, did not say I'm not. So I'm kind of thinking this is probably Jesus who came to Cornelius in a vision. Not quite sure, but he did. God reveals himself, rewards him with this vision. He says in, in verse 4, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And he told him what he needed to do. It's important for us to understand that Cornelius wasn't seeking Jesus. He was seeking God. He didn't know about Jesus. But he knew that he needed God. And a lot of times when people are seeking relationship with God, they know that God's out there. They know that God's real. They just don't know how to get there. don't know. They weren't raised in church. Even sometimes people who are raised in church don't know how to get God. A lot of times down south, they would say, he got religion. He got church. You hear the phrases. God revealed himself, rewards him with his vision. In Hebrews 11.6, which we heard in a sermon yesterday, said, without faith it is impossible to please God. believe that he is, that he's a re rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's what was going on here. Cornelius was doing the best he could. He didn't have any help. He was seek, trying to seek God the best he knew how. But God rewards that effort. How I wish that people would be more like this. It would be so easy to go out and witness to somebody if everybody was out there seeking God. But guess what? Not everybody's out there seeking God. As a matter of fact, a very small amount of people are seeking God. So God says, hey, send some guys to go get this fellow named Peter. He's in the next town. Tell him to come on. Okay. So he did. He dispatched some guy. So now we have this other fellow in the story named Peter. Peter we're a little bit more familiar with. He was the main apostle of Jesus. And Peter was in the next town over, Joppa. Now, Joppa and, and where Cornelius was, they're about 20 miles apart on the seashore, the Mediterranean Sea. So where Cornelius is up there in Caesarea is about 20 miles up. So it takes about a day to get there, a day to get back. So they, they took off. So Peter says on the next day, about noon, it says in verse 9, he went to pray. And while they were fixing lunch downstairs, he was upstairs praying, he fell into a trance, a vision state. Now, I can't say I've ever had one of these. But to fall into such a, a deep sense of prayer, meditation, that all of a sudden you're just in, you're in the presence of God. That's what happened. See, God needed to deal with Peter about something called prejudice. You know, the Jews had to endure the Holocaust, and before that, multitudes and years of persecution throughout all the history of the Jewish nation. Even now they are suffering persecution at the hands of those that are in the Middle East and Iran's trying to get after them. You got Syria, you got Jordan, you got everybody's trying to get into Israel. Trying to destroy them. So they're still under persecution. But they're also very prejudiced people against everybody else. I mean, it goes both ways. And it, it's recorded here in the Bible. And the reason is 
is because of religious zealousness. Now, religious zealousness is, this is the way I believe, and I'm right, and everybody else is wrong. Okay? Hear me on that? So if you believe that you're the only one who's right, when you get up to heaven, you're going to see you are very wrong. Now, I'm not talking about uh, people who don't believe in the scriptures, you know, uh, the Hindus and the Buddhists and all that. I'm not talking about those. I'm, ta I'm talking about Baptists and Church of God and Nazarene and, you know, these different Christian sects that we have. And yet we don't agree on some things. But it's important to agree on the essential things. But sometimes, even though we have the essentials down, we think that the distinctives has to be, everybody has to be on the same page. What makes us right? I, I can guarantee you right now, with 30 people in the room, we have 30 different opinions on at least one thing. I can guarantee it. It's just the way it is. And yet, we're all going to somehow get to heaven because we believe on Jesus Christ. And so Peter, he had these issues. He had some issues. And so God gives him this vision of these creepy things, creepy, crawly things. Down verse 12, the, the vision, well, let's start in verse 1. He saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet, uh, which in the Greek is, is a sail. A ship sail. Okay, that's the sheet that's coming down out of heaven. Um, it was lowered down by the four corners to the ground, and there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came up to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Did it a second time. And God said, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. It happened three times. Three times. Now, we know that the animals that were on this were not cattle, weren't goats, they weren't sheep. They were probably pigs and things they were not allowed to eat, according to the Jewish tradition and what's recorded in the law. He says, I can't do it, Lord. Can't. And God says, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. Three times. Some think that's just for emphasis, but remember, there's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Maybe it was there for emphasis that way too. No longer under the Lord, law. God had purified the unclean. He says, what I have cleansed no longer consider unholy. He might have a problem with that. Because, you see, he considered the Samaritans to be unholy, his neighbors. He considered the Egyptians to be unholy, his neighbors. He considered the Syrians to be unholy because they're Syrians. Remember in the Old Testament when um, Jonah he got sucked up by a whale because he didn't want to go to Nineveh because they were wretched, unholy people. They weren't kosher. God had to change his mind in the belly of a whale or great fish, however you want to say it. And so God tells Peter, look, this prejudice has got to end. We're no longer under law, law. Because, you see, once we too were unclean, we, too, were unclean. You know, um, when you think about it, that while we were yet without strength, Christ died for us. While we were still in our sin. The wages of sin is death. Uh, but there's no one righteous, no, not one. I could give you the whole Romans road right in this nutshell here, about how we are just under sin. If anybody can raise their hand and say, I'm not a sinner, you would be lying to yourself. Because we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But here's the good news. The blood of Christ has cleansed us. The blood of Jesus Christ. 
as cleansed them. Because unless you're Jewish, and there might be some people in here that are part Jewish, see, we're all Gentiles. I'm from Northern Europe. A lot of you are from Northern Europe. Some might be from Spain or Italy or, or even uh, South America or, or wherever. But the amount of people that are Jewish is even smaller than those that are American Indians. We're predominantly a Gentile nation. And so to Peter, in this regard, we would be unclean and unholy. But because of the blood of Christ, he sees us as clean and acceptable in his sight, so that we may boldly go to the throne of grace. So God had to change him. Peter had to be changed. I want us to notice in verse 19 through 33 is his transition in action. And again, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. But let's just say that he ignored some traditions for the sake of the gospel in verse 23. So he invited these people who came to call him to go to uh, Caesarea with him. He invited them in and gave them lodging. No no good standing Jew would have done that in that day and age. He just didn't invite Gentiles, especially the Romans who were the Jewish enemy. He didn't invite them in. And that's exactly, he didn't let them in. It says he invited them in, which means he encouraged them to come in. Change number one. Change number two is still part of that. And on the next day, he got up and went away with them. And he took along some of the other Christians that were with him at that time. Went up to Caesarea. He didn't travel with Gentiles. To them, they were dogs. I, I, I want you to understand the loathing sense that they had for non-Jewish people. In the old days, and when I say the old days, I'm talking about uh, my mom's parents' generation, okay, my grandma. You, know, you didn't venture outside your ethnicity, did you? If you were Italian, stay with the Italian. If you're Catholic, stay with the Catholic. If you're Baptist, stay with the Baptist. You know what I mean? You stayed within your core. Peter broke that rule, and he went outside of it. For the sake of the gospel, he went outside of the traditions of men. For the sake of the gospel, he invited them in. He went traveling with them, and he entered a Roman's house, verse 25. It was an opportunity that God gave Peter to share the gospel. Was it the memory of how Jesus treated other outsiders, the one with the issue of blood, the lepers, the blind, the poor, the lame, the Greeks, the Romans, and the list goes on. You know that WWJD thing? Yeah. We don't have to remember a whole lot of scripture. We just have to remember the facts. We come to the situation and we have to think, what would Jesus do? What does the Bible say about that situation? And maybe it's silent on that situation. Then you say, well, what would Jesus have done in this situation? He handled it with the love and grace that God gives you what Peter was doing. When he got there, he entered into the house. In verse 24, look at this. On the following day, he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Over in verse 33, I want us to look over there. Cornelius says in the second part of verse 33, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. 
Hey, that's any preacher's dream. I'm telling you. Everybody comes and say, oh, we're, we're waiting here, Pastor. We're all here, present before God, to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. That's any pastor's dream. That's okay. This is what God's given me. Boom. Oh, we didn't like that. No. Uh, I don't believe that's what God gave me. Uh, oh, pastor, by the way, blah, 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 blah. And you know what? Sometimes I hear it like that going out the door. <laughs> I haven't in many years, thank goodness. Thank goodness. But you know what? What an encouragement to a preacher. And what an encouragement to Peter to have heard that. Because he had gone through this transformation from Jaffa up to Caesarea. He had gone through a transformation, transformation into entering into even just the thought of entering into a Roman house. And he said, what do you want? Basically what Peter says, what do you want from me? Peter's opportunity, house of eager listeners, seekers. I want us to know in verse 33, it says they were assembled before God. You know that when you come into this place, there's nothing special about this building. Except it's falling apart. <laughs> you know, it's got cracks. Uh, I mean, we, we went through, we did the best we could cleaning it up before that associ association meeting we had yesterday. And yes, it was a lot like preparing for company coming over for Thanksgiving. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of cleaning up and touching up and doing all this stuff. But in reality, this is just a place where we meet. The thing is, when we meet here together, we are the church. We are assembled before God. You're not assembled before me. Okay? Let's get this straight. I'm just a man who's been given a message, who's been given a calling. I'm no different than you. We we're talking about that at the at the door today about how sometimes I get grumpy in the grocery store with those uh, those shoppers with the cart, you know, the guys. Uh, Will, Will's one of them. <laughs> but over at Kroger's, the, the lanes are really narrow in between. And there was this one guy with three three of those carts in a row that he was trying to fill up. And I said, I need to get there. And he wouldn't move the cart. I, I was getting grumpy. So I moved the cart out of the way. You know, I'm just like you. I have my isms too. We all do. And it's important to know that as you're assembled here before God, I'm assembled here before God too. I'm here to worship too. And that's what they were doing there. And then guess what happened? I think it's interesting in verse 34. I most, un, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. In other words, he didn't know that. He didn't get it. All these years of ingrained prejudice have been just ground into him. And maybe prejudice has been ground into you too. I know that you grew up in the South in certain communities. Prejudice is ground into you. Peter says, God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right welcome, uh, is welcome to him. In other words, if we seek the Lord, he is open to us. We seek him. It doesn't matter who you are. And so he gives the gospel about what Jesus did and what he went through. And he gets down here to verse 43. It says, Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Now what would you do if you're 
one of ten cancer patients all lined up in a row. And the doctor says, I have the cure for cancer, for all cancers. I have the cure, but I'm only going to give it out to these certain people, and the rest can't have it. What would you feel like? Wouldn't you feel hopeless, angry, sad, crazy? Think about all the emotions you'd go through. What do you mean you got the cure, but I can't have it? Oh, you're not the right person. You're not the right touch. You know, when, when uh, Aaron led us in that song about come as you are, that's all we can do. We can't come as somebody else. We can't pretend God knows everything. We come as we are because he already knows what's inside of us. He already knows what's up here and in here. He knows our past, our present, and our future. He knows it all. We come as we are. Guess what? We don't get to keep it. And so these these people, they were they were there at Cornelius' place. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. Why? Because they started to believe. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, I want that. And when they heard verse 34 there, or 43, I'm sorry, I got it backwards, that when they call upon his name, we believe that we receive forgiveness of sins, they they lash down like fish on right now. Yeah, that's a, they didn't just take a nibble of that hook, they swallowed it. It wasn't coming back. Holy Spirit fell on them who were still alive. God gave the light to understanding to Peter first about no partiality. Then the Gentiles hear and they believe. Now what does Peter do? What do I do now? They believed. <laughs> they be- it's kind of like Jonah and when he went in preaching, he said, oh, they're not going to believe it. And then they accepted and repented. Oh, man. Jonah just hated that. He went out and he mourned about it. They actually they actually believed. Peter saw that they believed. Now, there's a couple ways to view what just happened. One is that the Holy Spirit baptized them. That's what it says. Verse 45 says, all the circumcised believers, that's all the Jewish believers, Christians, who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. When it says poured out, he's thinking like the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit fell. Same wording. Matter of fact, this is the third dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And I know that's kind of a controversy in theology and everything, but just understand this This is the first time that the Gentiles came into the family of God as something new. God wanted to make sure it had the big stamp of approval on it, and he let the Holy Spirit fall. They began speaking in tongues. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit at this point. Now, back to the ways to view this. Holy Spirit baptized them, yes. Holy Spirit makes us part of the family of God. Yes. And then they went out and they baptized them in water. Water baptism identifies us as being part of God's family. It doesn't make us part of God's family. We already are part of God's family because we're baptized with the Holy Spirit the moment we believe. And then we get baptized with water to identify, hey, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. And then they start start speaking in tongues. Well, hmm, I don't think that was part of my experience. It is part of some people's experience. I know that. But tongues, the Bible says, is not necessary for salvation. If you read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 
But the tongues experience, like I said, another one of those where God has put his seal of approval on them had them speak in tongues as an outward expression of their salvation. Their walk had changed. Language had changed. They were changed. Now again, I, I don't say that this is a normal expression of people that are saved. It, it, it is for some, but not for all. And nor is it necessary for people who speak in tongues to be saved. But it is necessary for people to believe. Here's a skinny one. This man is too big. It just flat out does not matter who you are. Guess what? It doesn't matter what you've done. Paul himself was a murderer. It doesn't matter who you know. It does matter who you know. You need to know Jesus. When I say know Jesus, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Guess what? He starts that relationship with us. No. He, he's, he's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our friend. He's our brother. He's everything. And guess what? He doesn't become part of our family. We become part of his family. His family. So it doesn't matter if you're from Northern Europe. It doesn't matter if you're from Italy. It doesn't matter if you're from Africa, or Asia, or anywhere else. It doesn't matter because now you're part of a heavenly family. Now you're part of the family. In the baptism, verse 47. They got baptized to say. That day it was a big day. Today it's a big day. Say that I'm gonna speak. I've had people um, baptized in ponds before, pools, horse troughs, um, the baptistry back here, which by the way is in the floor. A lot of people don't even know that we have one. But you know, it doesn't matter where, but what matters is that you're not ashamed of it. When uh, we baptized in a big church down in uh, Kentucky, we had the whole family say, come. And they were inviting all their relatives to come. They would usually sit them pretty close to the front. And they say, who stands with this new believer? Parents would stand. Said, "Who did you bring with you?" They would show the relatives. Would you stand? To support the this new believer. The pastor would say, well, "We're going to pray for this new believer, and you're going to pray too." He says, "Would the rest of the church stand and support it?" We we pray. We lay hands sometimes on the person in front of us. Show our support. A believer. People sit down and go, What? Thing. Nothing more important. I don't know where you are in your walk today. I don't know if you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ or you haven't. I don't know if you've been baptized. I don't know if you have friends and relatives who believe. I can assure you. We're going to have prayer. Aaron's going to come up and uh, sing hymn invitation. You pray to God where you are. You can come up to the altar and be 
the steps to fall in love. Pray with me. Dear Howard, we need Now is our time to worship. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us so that the whosoever's of this world can believe and be saved. We thank you that you love this world so much. And when we say world, we mean people. That you gave your only son, your only begotten son. That whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. Because of Jesus, because of his gift. Friend, you may be here today and have been never called upon Jesus as your Lord. There's salvation in his name. All call all who call upon his name will be saved, the Bible says. You don't have to do anything special. You just have to believe. You may be here today and on the other side of that coin as a believer. But you don't want to share the gospel with certain people. Because you don't think that they should know. That needs to go away. Jesus does not show pleasure. No matter who you are or what you've done, Jesus is there and available. And you may have friends and family, you've heard this prayer many times, that we need to be talking to, we need to be praying for, so that they too may receive Christ. Whatever God is speaking to you today, maybe it's even something else. Why don't you lay it on the altar today and give it to Jesus? We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Normally I say let's all stand, but you're already standing, so let's stay standing. <laughs> stay standing. And if you'd like to come to the altar and you want to pray, you come while Aaron leads us in the song of the Clear? Amen.